Hello there. Operating a mandibular permanent second molars can be a big challenge in daily clinical practice. And this video may help you to understand a little more about this problem. I am Wendo Shibazaki, and together with Dr. Renato Martins, we want to thank the opportunity to share with you a just published article in the May 2022 issue of AJODO entitled Loads of Continuous Mechanics for Operating the Second Molar on Second Molar and Premolar. Isolated loss of the first molars is a very common problem worldwide, with a prevalence of about 8 to 21% to the entire population. Failure to address the loss of the first mandibular molars can lead to a mutual chip to the second molars, which is associated with occlusal interference, periodontal problems, and complications in the rehabilitation of the edentulous space. Although several force-driven approaches can produce the load system required for the second molar correction, such as cantilevers, clinicians usually opt for a shape-driven approach because of its simplicity. Because some orthodontists might expect molar extrusion to occur alongside this mechanics, the idea of bonding the molar tube more inclusively may sound interesting to produce an intrusive force to keep it from extruding. We tested this approach using three-dimensional load cells bonded to a patient's impression poured in acrylic resin. The patient had lost a right mandibular first molar and the second molar was measly tipped. We bonded brackets passively to the model's mandibular teeth using an arch wire as a guide, while the right second molar had a tube bonded according to its angulation at a 40 degree angle in relationship to the guide arch wire, but at the same height of the brackets. Then we registered the vertical forces and tipping moments produced by a 016 by a 020 20 22 inch nickel titanium wire at the second molar tube and at the second premolar bracket in five distinct clinical situations. Again, this aimed to simulate a clinical attempt to produce an intrusive force on the second molar in order to prevent its extrusion during uprighting by bonding the molar tube more closely. When the tube was bonded two millimeters cervical to the brackets, the wire produced an uprighting moment in an intrusive force at the second molar tube. As the tube was moved more inclusively, the wire produced slightly less uprighting moment while the extrusive force decreased. However, that force never ceased to exist as the tube was moved occlusally, where the arch wire produced 0.75 newtons or 76 grams of force when it was two millimeters occlusal. In order to estimate how close of the molar tube had to be in order to keep extrusion from happening, we made a regression line using the experimental data. We forecasted that it had to be bonded at about 6.7 millimeters occlusal to the remaining brackets for the arch wire to produce zero extrusive force. Of course, this would not be clinically feasible. It is important to mention that side effects on the second premolar bracket included a distal tipping moment and an intrusive force, all of which decreased with the molar tube being moved more occlusally. We concluded that in all situations tested, the rectangular nickel titanium arch wire tested produced an uprighting moment, but not without also producing an extrusive force at the molar tube. For more detailed information, access the full article on the AJODO website. Thanks for watching this video.